So, yes, I was a college student at Whitewater. I actually did one, uh, one, two semesters, one year at, at Oshkosh. Then I transferred back to Whitewater. Um, I, I live in the area. I actually commuted from McGuanago, where I, where I went to high school, uh, to Whitewater for the last three years. I found the internship program in a class talk of all places. Um, I, it must have been... It must have been the fall semester of my junior year. I was looking for an internship program that was finance related because that was my major. I had uh, I had started out as an accounting major and realized very quickly that that was the worst decision I ever made. So I quickly changed back to finance and then I was looking for an internship of any kind. Um, a couple of people in leadership with Northwestern came to the class talk on the campus there and I was, I was just intrigued, right? I, I had done a sales internship before uh, where, where you also had to produce paint jobs and if you've ever done house painting and hired people to do it that's pretty much the worst experience in the world so if, my thought was if i could if i could sell for an amazing company like northwestern not have to paint anything that might be the perfect fit and it turned out it was so i applied online got a phone call actually later that week and then i, I started interviewing for the internship program um, pretty much spent the rest of my career at whitewater working on the internship and probably being somewhat negligent to my studies, but at the end of the day, it worked out pretty well. Um, yeah, why I chose the internship. So, the, so the, the interview process is somewhat rigorous. You meet anywhere from three to four people. You have th three to four interviews over the phone and in person. And what, what stuck out to me is the fact that I really was in control of my own destiny. I love that I was told that I had the chance to build a practice, to build a clientele while I was in school. They told me if I if I set myself apart, if I if I put the work in, that I would have a career, a, a full time practice waiting for me at graduation. So I, I love that. I'm kind of OCD. Like I, I really wanted to have my career figured out. I didn't want to walk across the stage and then you know shrug and say what's next. I have no idea. I wanted to really have a game plan. So went to training, started the internship program, and it was just awesome. It was a perfect fit for me. I'll put it that way. Um, I got the chance to to be in a sales type environment where you know my my compensation was based on my my activity and the work that I put in so that that always resonated really well with me I had the chance to build my own practice and clientele and have clients that I had a personal relationship with and you know for me it was just the idea of long-term thinking owning a not just a you know not just being somebody that's selling some people some products or some investments or whatever it is but ultimately having a practice, having staff, having you know a, a comprehensive planning practice where we could really provide people exceptional planning that they're just not getting anywhere else. Um, so, so in the internship, I really learned those things. I learned how to communicate with people. I learned financial planning. I had all my life and health education paid for. I had um, my series licenses, right? My investment licensing was all paid for by the company. All I had to do is go put the work in, put the studying in, and they took care of the rest on the on the financial side. So every every month I was in the program, I was just getting more excited about being a full time advisor and, and having the chance to do this. Um, frankly, without school being in the way and being a distraction. And then finally that day came. So I was I was offered a full time contract at graduation, readily accepted it, and it was it was thrilling for me to walk across stage at graduation and come in on, on Monday with a full calendar and just kept working and kept doing what I was doing. Um, the days can vary quite a bit. I think it is it's good to break down like an internal day and a, and a field day. So Mondays are pretty much just internal, right? So I come in about eight. I usually roll in about eight oh four. I like to be about five minutes late for everything, but uh, get here about eight oh four, eight oh five. Uh, typically, I'm either preparing for the week. I'm doing some some catch up, answering emails over the weekend. Clients love to email over the weekend and ask a lot of questions, and so I'll usually catch up there. Uh, nine o'clock, I meet with our leadership team to talk about, you know, candidates we have in our selection process, both on the internship side and full-time potential advisors. So we walk through that. How do we like these folks? Are they going to be a good fit? And, and go through that process. Um, 10 o'clock, usually I will catch up a little bit more or I'll jump on the phones and start setting some appointments. Occasionally, I'll be actually in this room leading our we call it under five advisors in their weekly accountability meetings. So I do that about once every month or so. Um, then usually after that, I'm, I'm meeting with the, the full-time advisors that I mentor on a full-time basis. We meet weekly to help them grow their business, develop, do anything that they need help with. Um, and then pretty much the rest of the day, I'll meet with my, my staff individually and go over 
the entire week ahead of us for our practice, going over what are the, the appropriate recommendations for people, how to build out the planning, and just finalize everything that, that she's been working on for that week that we're, we're starting. Um, other than that, I'll pretty much do a little bit more phoning for the rest of the day. I'll try to set up some more appointments for the coming weeks, and then I pretty much call it a day. If it's summertime, uh, I usually take off about one o'clock and go golfing the rest of the afternoon, but that's one of the beautiful things about this career is that we have the chance to be flexible with our schedule and, and do things that we might not be able to do in corporate America. Um, now, if it's, a, if it's a Tuesday through Thursday, that's more of a field day. So typically I'll roll in about 8.05 again. But at that point, I'm, just, I'm getting caught up. I'm just checking on things for the day. Nine o'clock, I'm gonna be on the phone, setting appointments for the coming weeks. And then really from 10 until about six o'clock when I wrap up for the day, I'm seeing people, um, I'm, I'm in meetings or interviews, and that's it. If I if just so happens I'm not in an interview, I'm either you know calling potential intern candidates to set up interviews, or I'm calling potential um, clients or prospects to set initial meetings, right? So it's really one of the two. I'm either, I'm either setting appointments, trying to see people, or I'm in, in a meeting with someone. Fridays are pretty much entirely internal work again. Uh, we do our, our internship development meeting on Fridays. Um, it was during the school years anyways, or school semesters, I should say. Uh, it's also a big leadership day, so we do a lot of work with our network leadership. Um, but if, if I wasn't, it would just be another field day, another chance to see more people and, and work with more clients. So that, that's really a week in a nutshell. It can vary quite a bit. The greatest thing is that you do have ultimate flexibility. If you want to leave at four every day because you know, someday you're going to coach your, your son or daughter's sports team, you have that opportunity. If you want to be done early on Wednesdays like I do because you have church in the evening, perfect. You get to do that. So it's nice to be able to put more meetings on certain days when you have that flexibility. And then your, who is your ideal candidate? Um, as far as a, a person who is going to be coming in as a potential client, so okay. who, who do you normally work with or what do you like working with? Yeah, so the people we work with, it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's really the first area is medical professionals. So a big reason for that is because you know, if, you, if you know anything about the medical field, their schedules are insane, right? So their, their shift always goes over what it's supposed to be. They're on, they have on-call hours, they work nice weekends, holidays, like they, they just don't have the time to come home and, and be their own financial planner. Like they don't have the time to become extremely financially literate. So we, we've been able to help them a lot just to understand some of these things in a concise way. Um, the other thing is that to be in the medical field, you have to go to college for this, right? You, in order to be in the profession, you have to go get that degree or, or whatever the credentials are. Um, a lot of times the schooling is longer than just a four-year degree, but regardless of how long it is, the cost of education is increasing exponentially, right? So we've been able to help quite a few of those people with student loan forgiveness where it's applicable, but also just on debt repayment strategies. And then I think the last thing is that to be in the medical field, generally you have to be pretty able-bodied to do your, your practice. Um, Got to work with your hands. If you're a cutter, you have to, you have to be able to hoist people if you're in the, the nursing field and get them into the into beds and things like that. So we were able to help them protect their income from any type of a disability or illness, make sure that they still get their paycheck and still be able to pay their medical bill or their student loan debt, excuse me. Um, so that's one area we work a lot with is nurses, practitioners, therapists, dentists, physicians, residents, and all those folks. Um, if it's not those people, it's usually people ages 55 to 70. So we call these retirees. So they're about five years from retirement or five years into it. Biggest problem here is that 41% of people will pass away um, after they run out of money, right? So they will run out of money before they die. And that, that, that's a problem, right? The fact that there's that many people that are, that are going to outlive their money. So our focus here is helping them maximize what they get from social security. Um, you know, have the highest monthly income that they can have that's sustainable. Help them have fixed income and have pension income if they don't have any in conjunction with Social Security. Just making sure that they're in the lowest tax bracket possible so they can spread their money out further and, and live more generously. Um, that's really who we're with all day, every day. We, we know those worlds pretty well, so we, we try to stick with what we know best. Planning is, I've really broken it down into these three buckets because well, that's the extent of how creative I am, but we call it buckets, boxes, segments, whatever you like it to be. But it's just three places to save money, right? And if I can 
walk through these briefly. The first bucket we're looking at here, this, this short-term bucket, it's your cash saving, right? And the thing to remember is there's always give to get in finance. There's always gonna be a trade-off. So what you have here is complete liquidity. You have access to these funds anytime you need them. They're available by the click of a button at this point. You can pay for things or take money out. Um, the, the benefit here too is that there's no risk, right? The market's down about 30% here in 2020. Your bank account that hasn't been changed at all. So that's another benefit you have there. The downside to this is that there's no rate of return or virtually no rate of return. If you're making a half a percent in this bucket, give me a call because I'd like to change banks. That sounds fantastic. So that's the, that's the trade off here in that first bucket. If, if we're telling someone's story or really, you know, for anybody, it's the emergency fund, having the right amount of cash that just makes you sleep well at night. It's having the right amount in there to pay bills month in, month out. It's, it's having the funds to travel or do whatever you're passionate about, whatever you love spending money on. We need to keep money here, right? The other two buckets are what we call the wealth building buckets or segments or whatever. Skipping ahead to the third one, this is the aggressive segment. So these are the dollars we're growing for the future. We're gonna use these for our income and retirement. Third bucket, the aggressive one, is it's invested dollars, market correlated assets. Um, you know, there's a lot of different options within here, but the moral of the story is it's all market driven, right? And, and what I always ask people is, <clears throat> how, or how do you characterize your level of trust in, in the market? And you get a variety of answers, right? But what everyone can attest to is that the market's volatile. We have years like 2002, 2008, 2018, 2020. We have these down markets and there's, there's more sprinkled in between there that are less drastic. But we have these down markets every four or five years, right? And you know, long term, we're gonna go up over time. The S&P 500 has never been negative over any 15 year period, but we know that each and every year is, is really, it's, it, there's no way of knowing. Could be up, could be down. So, <clears throat> What, we, what our clients invariably tell us is they'd like to have a safe, risk-free asset in their wealth building picture that's completely independent of market risk, not market correlated. So that's really what our middle bucket says. You get a guaranteed minimum rate of return and these dollars cannot go backwards. So the market could be down 40%. This money keeps moving forward with constant momentum, right? And, and what we're really doing here is we're, we're hedging risk. We can't put everything in checking savings because there's inflation. Everything gets a little bit more expensive by about two and a half percent every year. Okay, so money that's sitting in here, if it's excessive, is losing money, right? So we use these other two buckets to build wealth that outperforms inflation. Okay, so the third one that that brings up our second type of risk, which is market risk or systematic risk, is what they call it, and it just says that the market's inconsistent; it fluctuates. So to hedge that risk, we use that safer bucket. And, that, and now we have that covered. The last type of risk is really tax risk. So tax risk, right? We notice this, this difference here, Roth versus traditional dollars. And the, the biggest problem with tax risk is simply the difference of these two. So when most people don't, you know, they, they might've been told what the difference is before, but they don't really memorize this stuff, nor do they have the time to. But traditional is what we're most familiar with in this country. And it's, it's when you start with a 401k, you're defaulted into traditional. And let's just say someone's making $100,000 per year as a nurse practitioner or, or a PA or whatever. And you know they put 10%, put $10,000 per year into their traditional 401k plan. Well, the benefit there, again, give to get, the benefit is that you're only gonna pay taxes on the remaining 90,000. So you get, you get a tax deduction today. That's what you get. What you give up is the fact that down the road, you're gonna owe taxes on that 10,000 plus everything it grew into, right? Give to get. We're paying taxes later, right? And we're not gonna pay them today. Roth is the exact opposite. So in this scenario, you make 100,000, you contribute 10,000 if you could. Limitations as you can't, but maybe you have a spouse that lets you do that. But you contribute 10,000 you're still gonna pay taxes here on 100. There's no deduction. The benefit to this is that when you get to retirement, that 10 grand plus everything it grew into is entirely tax-free. And this is where people start to ask, well, well, which one's better? It sounds like I'm gonna pay taxes at some point. So that's totally true, but let's think about a couple of things. And if you talk to most young professionals, you know, are, are they gonna be making more money today or 30 years from now as they approach retirement? Well, certainly 30 years from now, unless 
they get really lethargic and lose all ambition, they're probably going to be making more money. They get promoted, they you know, go to a new company that you know, pays them more, uh, they do more education, they get paid more, whatever the case is. The only problem with getting paid more money in this country is that you pay a higher percentage to the government. So we can tell almost invariably that people are probably going to pay more taxes as they progress in their careers, right? But the other thing is, let's look at the economic climate that we're in. You know, the U.S. deficit right now is $22 trillion. You know, Social Security and Medicare are you know, in a lot of trouble. It's going to take more tax dollars. And believe it or not, you, you wouldn't think so looking at your pay stub, but we're in a historically low tax bracket. Right? Taxes just went down back in 2018 in spite of those other things. There's probably only one direction taxes are going next. And we, and we can't speculate, right? But all we can do is plan for what's, for what's legitimate. And what we do know is that Trump's tax cuts were great, but in 2026, they go right back up. It's built into the legislation. So we know for a fact taxes will be higher down the road, but then we can also, again, we don't know if it's gonna be higher or lower just on its own. Well, we have yet to see, but what we should do is plan for either scenario, okay? But let's think about this last factor. Let's, let's say you were gonna buy a home, right? Let's say you went, went to the bank and said, hey, I need a 30-year mortgage, you know, for this, this size house, call it 250,000. Then they said, sure, we'll, we'll give you this 30-year mortgage. There's one caveat to it. We get to decide the interest rate at the end of the 30 years and you gotta pay it. No one in their right mind has taken that mortgage. Matter of fact, some people did back in 05, 06, 07, it was called arm loans. But it wasn't at the end of 30 years, it was at the end of seven years, and it caused the housing crisis, right? So what happens here is no one's doing that because the bank could make up anything. And when we defer taxes, we effectively do the same thing. We tell the IRS, I'm going to defer these taxes 30, 40, 50 years. You can make up whatever you want when we get there, and I'll pay it. What's scary about that is, let's say you had $2 million saved up, and it was all pre-tax. You don't really have $2 million. You might have $1.5 million today. Taxes go up, now you got 1.3 million. Someone else decides how much of your money belongs to you. And, and that doesn't work very well. Now, there's going to be some pre-tax money. Company matching is always pre-tax. Sometimes that's your only option to get that matching is you have to save pre-tax. Free money is free money. We never leave that on the table. But to every legal extent possible, we like tax efficient assets, like the Roth account, like that middle bucket, which is a... a, a cash accumulation oriented, well-designed type of life insurance. Both of these are tax deferred with tax-free withdrawals or at least withdrawal options, right? So that's how we're looking at building out the wealth building picture. Now let's take a look at what this analysis is for just a, a given client. So this happens to be my staff person that we just did her review recently. So I'm going to scroll through what I tell clients exactly. So there's about 38 pages to this. So we're going to hit the highlights. So if you see anything look really interesting, we don't stop that. Just let me know. First thing we talk about is disability income protection. So she has a decent amount of coverage in place with an existing policy already. It's this dark blue color here. She also has a group policy with, with our practice here that we pay for. So she has a decent amount of coverage. She could probably use a little bit more right now just to make sure she's protected in the meantime. But, but critically important on the disability side, you know, we can talk about buckets and saving and investing all day long, but if you can't work because of a sickness or a disability or God forbid a cancer or something, like how are you going to continue to make those savings contributions? How are you going to pay your bills, right? Let alone investing, are you going to put food on the table? So protecting the source of, that, of all the finances is, is critical. <clears throat> and let's continue on here. So we'll look at the retirement picture. And so, so just a quick breakdown here, I would go through with, with the prospect or the client, you know, we're looking at your retirement goal age, 62 years old, and we're trying to we're set that out till 90, right? It's a little bit longer than the average lifespan, but we'd rather be on the side, the side of conservative. So let's say 62 to 90, that's her retirement years. And we're looking at having $32,400 per year in retirement, $2,700 a month. Okay, net of tax, and that's in today's dollars. So we applied inflation to that at 2.5%, so she's going to need closer to 77000 to have the same purchasing power as 32.4 today. So that's our goal. That's what we're shooting for. And here's what she has available. So she has 
she has eight, uh, call it 18.5 in social security benefit. Now we run a very reduced benefit, about 75% of what her grandparents would have received. So again, worst case scenario, but we'd rather be on the side of conservative. Then we have withdrawals actually from a well-designed cash value life insurance policy. So her peeling out income from that every year. Then we have her simple IRA plan that we have here at the practice. So 3% contributions she makes, and then I match 3% as well. And then she also has a Roth IRA that she had been contributing to in the past, but, but hasn't been as of late. So all in all, if those things continue, the Roth just stays there, grows by itself. Her simple IRA, she keeps putting in the three and, and we match the three. And she got about $7,500 there. Those accounts make 7%. She'll be at about 500000 509000 just under that in the simple plan and just under 18000 in her Roth account at 62. And here's a good snapshot of what that looks like. And what we're looking at here is each year her taking withdrawals from the assets that she's accumulated. So the dark green is social security, right? The light blue is that life insurance strategy. And then the yellow is actually liquidation from the simple account and this little hunk of orange there is liquidation from the Roth account. So she's not in a bad spot at all. As a matter of fact, she's covered 100% until about age 72. So we actually just had our review and what we discussed is that the most advantageous thing she could do going forward is start putting $150 a month into a Roth account, right? So that was really the only change we made. And here's the comparison. And what you see is there's more orange on here. We had showed her putting that extra 150 away into a Roth account on a systematic basis. And that puts her 100% funded for retirement. Right. And that's what we just showed as a comparison. Here, here's where you're at now. And if we put in the recommendations that we're making today, the strategic course of action that we've laid out, here's how well funded you are. It turns out she's 100%, right? She actually has a surplus of about $100,000 when she passes away. Again, all things being equal, right? So that, that's a typical analysis we'd walk through with a client just to show them, here's where you're at. People want to know where they're at. Like if you ask someone, you know, knowing you want to retire at 60 years old or 65 or whatever, and you, you need this much income, how confident are you in your ability to retire with the savings you're currently doing? Do you know for a fact you will have enough? What's the amount you need to have accumulated by that point to live comfortably and, and for retirement to be sustainable? And people have no idea. They, they feel good because they have a 401k plan because they're putting some money away, but they have no idea if it's enough, if it's too much, too little, or whatever it might be. So that's what we can tell them with precise accuracy. Here, here's what we're really you know, going to have and what we can anticipate. And here's, here's what it does compared to what your goals are.